not going to forget tonight, eh? It's nice and warm. I'm glad I wore my black shirt tonight and not a white shirt. Man, I'm blessed to be here. I know it's been a while. We've been trying to work out how to make this happen, but I'm here. Look at you, even providing a shot glass there with a bit of water. I appreciate that. And I've got this cold one here as well. We'll put that one there. Hey, can I pray before we get started tonight? It's funny you just said just then that, you know, you get, people are going to get pregnant or, you know, in the Word of God. I actually feel like as I was in worship, someone here, you can't actually, you've been told you can't fall pregnant, but in the next six weeks, you're going to fall pregnant. You've been told you can't do it. It's not going to happen through IVF. It's going to happen supernaturally, whoever you are here. Father, right now, we declare, Lord, into being in this atmosphere, supernaturally, Father, Lord, there's going to be a pregnancy take place that, Lord, is going to even wow the doctors, Father. God, we speak into this atmosphere right now, miracles. We speak provision, Father. We speak a key that will unlock this area of Brisbane, Father, Lord, for your glory. We declare, Father, Lord, that we've come to church on this warm night, but it's only going to get hotter in here because we want to see you do something fresh in you. We declare fresh encounters from heaven tonight. We're ready for a move of God, Father. We're ready for you to do what only you can do. And I pray that tonight, Lord, that this church will be blessed, Father. In this atmosphere, we speak miracles into being, Father. Lord, the things that the world would say are not possible, Father. We open up heaven and we say, God, do what only you can do, the impossible. Lord, let this not be just another night, Father. Remember, because it was a really warm and hot night, Father. I pray that tonight, that God, you would use me somehow to impart faith into this atmosphere. Something so unique, Lord, would happen tonight, Father. Lord, that even in the years to come, I say there was something that took place that night that unlocked a key into this area, Father. We thank you for all that has been. Lord, we thank you right now for Pastor Mark, Pastor Nina, and the whole team here. We pray, God, that this year will be the most fruitful year. Not just a faithful year, but a fruitful year this year, God. We pray over this worship team tonight, Lord, that, God, there'll be a new level of anointing. And, God, we thank you, Lord, for every person in Jesus' mighty name. We all said amen. amen. Why don't you high-five three people and say thank you for wearing one of your top three outfits tonight. Thank you for wearing one of your top three outfits to church. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate it. Don't go too far. I need the Holy Spirit back, all right? So appreciate it. Well, I am so glad to be here. I bring greetings from the Gold Coast, the old Gold Coast, eh? More than just a theme park, more than just a beach. It's an area that's rapidly finding Jesus, and I love that. And um, I, do, uh, I do always feel very honored to bring the Word of God. I feel like a very humble young church planner who accidentally has stumbled across, across the grace of God when it comes to reaching lost people. And tonight, I really pray that me being here isn't just a nice message or I haven't just come to bring my best of message. I always pray that God, whenever I come to anywhere to preach God's word, that I would deposit something into the atmosphere that you would see by the time I've left something take place that would see souls one in this area, that you'd hear see un, uh, surprising stories of people you thought would never come to church would start turning up the church. You know, there's people you've ever said, hey, they'll never come to church. You need to stop saying that. You need to stop saying that. You need to say, hey, that person that I thought would never come to church, they're coming to church. Declare it into the atmosphere that Jesus is going to make a way in their life. I love it. Everyone's just waving. I feel like I'm in a, the south of America here tonight. This is good. In Atlanta, Georgia or something. I was wondering why when I first got here, Pastor Mark said, here's a, here's a towel for you. Here's two. And I thought, why? What do we need all this for? Now I know. I'm going to bring T.D. Jake's anointing tonight. I've got three towels up here ready by the time I finished. Uh, you know, I uh, just uh, I do bring greetings. Um, Ten years ago this year, we planted a church called Glow Church on the Gold Coast, and uh, it was with 20 people. And we started off on a night just like this, in a little little veranda in a place called Majuraba. Uh, and if I showed you a photo of the team of people that gathered that night, you'd say it's impossible what God has done. They're just an average group of people. There was more kids there. Their kids were so noisy in the swimming pool. I was like stepping out of faith, going, "We're going to plant this church." You know. Ten years later, we are now in not only the Gold Coast, but we have three churches in Sydney, one in Melbourne, three in the UK, one in Seoul, and about to plant a church in Houston, Texas. And for the latest count, we have almost 10,000 people called Glow Church Home. And I'm telling you, it's got to be the grace of God because 20 people 10 years ago in a climate where... If we're going to clap, come on, let's give God praise. Let's not, no, no golf claps here tonight. I'm telling you. That's the grace of God. I don't, I don't say that to show off, but honestly, in telling you, humbly speaking... I believe it's because we've tapped into going after the, the one. You know, so, time, so many times we can be so focused on the 99, but Jesus was focused on the one. And we have ones in our world everywhere, at university, at your school, at your work tomorrow, your neighbor. And if that was God's heart for people, 
then what can happen is that so often we can get caught up, even being like in a Bible built area where it's like we focus on the 3%, but what about the 97% that don't know Jesus right now? I'd call that a blue ocean opportunity, not a red ocean opportunity where there's blood in the water, everyone's fighting for someone. Find those people that Jesus loves, that He's after, He's after their heart, and go after those people and see what Jesus will do. And so I wanna remind you that tonight, that we are called to live on mission. We are called to make a difference. And so if you've got your, your notepads tonight, if you've got a pen, if you've got you know, uh, maybe a phone that you wanna take notes on, I pray that I can deposit something here that's just gonna be more than just you hear it and walk away and have a good night, but that you can catch up on it this week, whether it's during your quiet time this week. And if you don't know what to do, just get a pen and write on the person's neck in front of you. You'll remember it. You will not forget tonight. But Pastor Mark and Nina, thank you so much for having me. You guys are a great blessing. I, I gotta tell you, like if there was an award for like most loved pastor amongst pastors, I reckon you guys would go very close. And honestly, you would. I reckon everyone loves the Elmos. They just love them because they're always so friendly, so kingdom-minded. And it's just so easy to say yes to want to be here tonight because I know that, you know, you would be very loved if you're in this church. I know that. And uh, you have got great pastors. You should be very confident of that and believe it for great days ahead for you guys. Great days ahead. Good golf as well. You know, good golf as well. I have just come back from a sabbatical. It wasn't one of those sabbaticals where it was naughty boy sabbatical. It was good boy. You had a good, good 10 years of building the church. Strategically, have a break, freshen your soul up, ready for all that God has. And so from September the 17th last year until January 3rd this year, I literally took my SIM card out of my phone. I closed off my emails, turned off my social media, and we literally just had a break. A break just to say, what do you want for the next 10 years of Glow Church? What do you want for us as a family? I have a wife called Ellen. She's my only wife. She's all that I can afford. She's great. We've been married for 23 years this year. And we have three, teen, uh, we have, well, so we have two, two teenage children, but one is 17 and one is 15. They're both girls. It's very emotional at my house. Pray for me. Very emotional times. And then I have a little boy called Judah who's nine years old and he's a superstar soccer player in the making. He just uh, started the Queensland Academy. He signed a first professional contract a few weeks ago as a 10-year-old, or well, as a nine-year-old for under 10s, ready to play for Liverpool one day. So I'm very, very blessed about that. But that's my family. And you know, sometimes, you know, doing all that we can do for God, it's very easy that you can sometimes forget about the things that matter most. And I was just so determined in this last season to say, God, this crucial age my daughter is at in year 12, my beautiful year 10 student daughter and my son, I said, oh, God, I just want to give my full attention. Thank you for all you've done. But you know what? It's amazing as you get intentional, it's amazing what you reap. We've been blessed, but also my soul has felt so fresh. And I've had the opportunity to really just be spending time with God and say, God, what does the next 10 years of my life look like? What does the next 10 years of the church look like? Not just Glow Church, but the church globally. God, what are you up to? What are you wanting to do next? And I felt like God has given me some little, some little breadcrumbs of what He's about to do next in the, the church and the kingdom of God. And so I hope tonight that as I'm preaching the Word of God, that maybe some of that will come out a little bit in what I'm preaching. And I do believe that something very special is gonna happen. I mean, I've got on my wrist here the word encounter. We've declared it across our year that it's a year of encounter. I do believe this year, September, October, November, in that period, there's gonna be a revival kickoff in this country. There's gonna be a move of God start to happen. And I tell you what, churches that are hungry, can I encourage you, you don't go to a buffet, uh, you know, already eating at McDonald's on the way there. You turn up hungry to a buffet. You turn up ready to eat the steak and the pasta and the bread and whatever. I'm telling you, I believe that God's getting ready to kick off a re revival in this nation. That a move of God is gonna take place. There's gonna be a desperation for God. We can't just get satisfied with just ticking the box and saying, I went to church or we went through the run sheet and it was great. I'm talking about a move of God that is gonna do away with run sheets. It's gonna do people that you never thought would turn up into the house of God are gonna turn up because they are desperate for God to turn up in their circumstances. I believe in that this year. And at the start of this sabbatical, we, uh, as, a, as a couple, myself and Ellen, we, we had a dream. And about five years ago, we, we knew that the sabbatical was coming and we were saving, saving, saving because we had a dream that we would go to the Greek islands to Mykonos and to Santorini to celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary and our 20th, well, both of our 40th birthdays. And that was in 2020. Now, I don't wanna bring up the past, but 2020 was a painful year for many of us. And I know you have your own horror stories about bookings, but we had booked and paid fully for a cruise on the Mediterranean. We had booked our flights over there and literally COVID kicked off. And not only did our sabbatical go out the window, but I've never had to lead at a more trying time. I'm sure your pastors did a great job during that time. But during that time where we had to like, you know, it was all hands on deck, had to lead extra board meetings, extra things happening all the time. And we had, we had you know, saved all this money. We were ready for this dream. And we got married in the year 2000, the day after the Sydney Olympics. Originally, we we're from Sydney. And so in Sydney, 
when the Olympics finished, everyone got on a plane that was from some other country or went back to somewhere else. And so for three weeks, we could not get a flight anywhere. And guess where we went for our honeymoon? North Brisbane, no, we didn't. We went to the Gold Coast. And I didn't know we were ever gonna live on the Gold Coast, but we went to the Gold Coast, we went to the Moroccan, it had a blue carpet, we had cane furniture. But when you're 20 years old and you're married and you've been waiting for that moment to get married and you haven't gone and done naughty things, I tell you what, you didn't care what the carpet looked like. You just, I was just happy to be married to my beautiful wife. And uh, all those years later, we came back to serve God on the Gold Coast. We were very thankful we had our first daughter. But we had been dreaming about this holiday, been saving, and then it all came crashing down. But during the sabbatical, we had the dream awaken again. They, I know that some of you might have lost money during that time, but for us personally, thankfully, our, our travel agent kept our money uh, in store, ready for us to have this holiday. And so we flew from here, from Australia, over to Europe. We went to Rome for a few days just to set the, set the, the scene for this amazing trip. And then we left from Rome, and it was first stop, Mykonos. Now, Mykonos, if you've never been there, it's in the Greek Mediterranean islands. And so it's about two days journey from the cruise uh, that we were leaving from in Rome all the way to Mykonos. And we were heading there and me and Ellen were talking about how much we've been looking forward to this dream of ours, how excited we're finally we're gonna go to Mykonos after 20 years of talking about it. And as we were getting about five to six hours nautical, hour, five to six hours sailing time away from Mykonos, the captain comes over the loudspeaker on the ship and says, according to international maritime law, that if a ship is ever in distress, we have to go and help it. And we've just been told that there is a yacht that is in trouble, and so we're gonna to have to go off course, and we're gonna go have to help rescue this particular yacht. And I looked at Ellen and I said, please tell me this is not gonna be one of those stories. <laughs> we are all the way on the other side, of the, we have flown all the way here, we are on the boat, we are now six hours out from our dream, and now we hear there's an international emergency. And so our boat literally turns around. You can follow it on a map. It just turned around and started going right back to where we just come from through the Sicily Straits and then up into the north. We're talking about a, almost a whole night of sailing. And we had gone to bed. We were just relaxing. We were watching the Premier League. Oh, I was watching the Premier League. My wife was probably getting close to going to sleep and I was enjoying some sport. And then outside of the window, we see these flashlights start to come from the depth of the dark of the night through into our window. And now I've got to tell you, like, we opened those curtains up and sure enough, there was a full-blown international rescue happening outside the window of our yacht, or out of our cruise. And we looked down and there was this yacht and it turns out there was 107 refugees from Albania that had stolen a yacht. There was supposed to be 12 people on board this yacht. There was no life jackets and they were literally about an hour away from sinking in the middle of the Mediterranean. And so you've got adults, you've got kids that are jumping from the yacht as it's now been attached semi-attached semi to the Italian Coast Guards and they're, they're yelling out instructions in Italian over the loudspeakers. They're going, buongiorno, past, I don't know what else they were saying, but they were, they were like literally, they were on this yacht and like every so often the, there would be a separation between the, 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 the Italian Coast Guard and this yacht because the, the choppiness of the waves and there'd be kids literally jumping from one to the other and literally if they had gone under, it was all over because they couldn't swim, there was no life jacket. So we're watching this operation take place and 107 refugees are rescued and Actually, you know what? We got no compensation from our cruise company for this, by the way. None. So I don't mind showing you our, our iPhone footage from the event because you know what? Norwegian Cruise Line gave us nothing, so I'm gonna, just gonna show you this. But this is, my, this is our, our iPhone footage. My wife, Ellen, took this. Have we got a video? I don't know which screen you use, if it's behind me here, if it's there. Okay, here you go. Th this here, Jeez. this here is the Italian Coast Guard now with 107 refugees on board. And this is the cruise about to, so the yacht about to smash into our, our cruise ship. It Maybe it's meant to be. And literally put a hole inside oh, of our cruise ship in the middle of the Mediterranean. And I know what you're thinking, Titanic? You can turn that off for a moment. I know you're thinking Titanic is going down. Well, thankfully, they were very quick to be able to do some work on the side of the boat. But I'm telling you, like that, that yacht literally like had lost power and went straight into the side of our cruise ship, a big, big boat. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no way they're gonna cancel Mykonos and Santorini. Like we've just rescued these people. We've come from the other side of the world. And then we get a message from the, the captain of the ship saying, look, we're gonna to have to have a relook at our roots. We're gonna to have to look at the wind. We're gonna to have to look at all the different things that are happening. And, and we'll let you know in the morning what the plan is. So we go to sleep and at 8 a.m. in the morning, the captain comes back on and says, we're really sad to let you know that we've decided we're gonna to have to cancel going to Mykonos and to Santorini. Like Ellen literally just broke into tears right on the spot. 
We went up to the breakfast area. There, there were grown men and women crying because they were, that was their dream to go to Santorini and to Mykonos. There were people there. They were on their honeymoon that wanted, they had compromises. One wanted to go on a cruise, one wanted to go to Santorini. So that was their compromise. We're going to go on the cruise to go to Santorini. I'm talking about angry people. We're thankful that the, the refugees who rescued me were very thankful, but now we've got many outspoken people from a particular country, America, that were very unhappy and we're letting everyone know on the boat what they felt about the disappointment. I've got to tell you, we had gone from one part of the world all the way to see our dream disappear right in front of our eyes. We were on a mission to go to Santorini and see those beautiful white houses. My wife, Ellen, even made a little Instagram image and, and drew little white houses with her marker pen just to make it feel like we went there. <laughs> but we never got to Mykonos. We never got to Santorini. And instead, they took us to this little island called Calicus. I call it Calicus Crappa. That's all I can call it. There's nothing else. It was the worst island I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and it's where Olympus is. And it turns out they took us there because they wanted to make sure that the refugees did not get on our boat and that we didn't have now a refugee crisis happening because they wanted to make sure that they had literally gone with the Italian Coast Guard. The Greeks didn't want the Italians to bring them on to the ship. And so it was quite a, a political situation was, do the Norwegians take control of this because it's a Norwegian ship? Is it the Italians? Is it the Greek? We don't know how they worked it out. They don't know how they cast lots. I don't know what happened. But it turned out that we had to get actually scrutinised and that's why we didn't get to go to Santorini and Mykonos. You, this is the moment that so many can all go, oh, that's not nice. You wouldn't have appreciated it. I didn't appreciate it. But you know what? That's what life has been like for a lot of people, metaphorically, in this last season. Maybe before COVID, you had some dreams that you were working towards. Maybe you had a plan or a mission that God had put in your heart. Maybe God had given you a dream to reach a certain group of people. Or maybe you had started a small group of people and you had those people sort of leave your life because they had to now, now move on. Maybe you're here and you lost a loved one during COVID. Maybe you had a business that went under during COVID. And it's so easy for many of us to feel that disappointment that we were going towards a direction. Maybe you were so close, like we were metaphorically so close to that mission being achieved, that dream in our heart after 20 years. But out of nowhere, a suddenly moment that was out of our control took that dream from us. That sheer disappointment or that sheer pain to go, you were so close, but yet so far. And I wonder tonight if there's some people here that know what it feels like to be so close to that God dream, so close to that miracle, so close to that business succeeding, so close to that family unit coming back together. And yet right at the last moment, out of your control, disappointment, heartbreak, pain, challenge. Where are you, God? Why would you let this happen to me? Now, I know a small group of people love the COVID season that you got to stay at home and watch Netflix and eat popcorn all day. But for many people, it's been a real sudden change of life. Things have changed. Things are different. And I wonder if it's fair to say that maybe in this room that you too could be a little bit off mission right now. Maybe there are people that God's got in your world that because you've got so comfortable with what you want and how you're going to get through this and how you're going to make finances work for you and how you're going to make sure that you're comfortable and you have the things that you need. And yet all around us there are people that are God's mission field for us, God's heart for us, that if we're not careful, we're not reminded, we can miss the very thing that Jesus said that He was coming for. Now, I am unashamedly, unequivocally telling you, I'm a young guy who's in love with Jesus and I believe in the power of the local church. I believe that the local church is truly Jesus' answer for the world. But even in this last season, there's been a lot of cynical Christians that have had a dig at the church, have had a dig at the way that we did go about things or we didn't go about things or whether we could go to church and have a service or we couldn't have a service. I mean, we've all had those conversations, but can I tell you that Jesus told us that the local church was His answer? The local church was the answer for the northern part of Brisbane. The northern chance was not only it was the solution for your neighbour, but I'm telling you tonight that it's the solution to make sure that lost people that don't know Him right now know Jesus. And so I stand here unashamedly saying to you, I'm a young guy that believes in what the local church can bring to the world. But I'm sadly think there's a lot of people that have lost the mission. And tonight I'm here to remind you that Jesus has got a clear plan for your life within that mission. Maybe in this last season you have experienced some disappointment. Maybe there's been some pain. I know in our church we saw many stories of people that were on Zoom calls watching their loved ones pass away in other countries. A young girl in our church in Sydney watching her dad, she's an only child, 
She wasn't allowed in a Westmead hospital as she watched her dad pass away on Zoom. Maybe you could share that story. Maybe in this room there's been pain of people that lost their lives. Maybe there's just been the pain of watching loved ones that just never came back to church. People that once were on fire for God, loving people, serving people that just got caught up in conspiracy theories or pain or hurt and they just have not returned. And it's in those moments that your response in the unknown and the trust of God in the uncertainty, it really matters and it can determine so much of what's to come. You need to understand that the enemy has got a full-time assignment to stop you from all that God has. The Bible tells us the enemy has come to steal, to kill and destroy. But the good news tonight is that Jesus has come to bring life and bring life to the full. I don't know what position you find yourself on the fence tonight in your hurt or disappointment. You could be blaming God for that pain. You could be asking God why. But I want to remind you tonight that Jesus truly is on the move. And if you trust that Jesus has got a plan for you tonight, He's also got a plan for the person next to you. He's got a plan for the people you don't know right now that are in this area. And we have a responsibility to be reminded that He is in control. Maybe you're here tonight and you would say, I used to know what God's plan was for my life, but I've got a little bit confused. I feel like at the moment, I don't know what God has for me. Did you know that that's the most Google question that people ask is why am I here? It's followed closely by what is my purpose? Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, that's the question being asked by people. But maybe post COVID, the question is, why am I still here? Have I still got a purpose? Is there, is there purpose in the pain? And so tonight, I think we're gonna take a little dive into the Word of God to show us that this last season is not a surprise to God. There's been many people that have faced painful seasons, disappointing seasons that have got a little bit off track from the mission that they had for their life, the dreams that have been quenched in their life. And I wanna read to you from 2 Samuel chapter 11 about a guy called King David. King David was a very unique man because we actually get to see not only the good part of David's life, but we see all the tragedy as well. We see the scope of him from a young boy, smelling like sheep and beating off lions and bears, right through to being anointed as king. Even though no one else, no one else saw that he had potentially had the potential. But we also see him in his old age, but we see the good, the bad and the ugly. And that's why I like the story of David. So turn with me tonight to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're gonna read to you tonight and show you something that David knows what it feels like to come off mission. Are you ready for me to read tonight? Got the scripture, look at that. Hope you've got your glasses on tonight with this one. In the springtime, at the time when kings would go off to war, please highlight that fact, when kings would go off to war, David sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed, destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabah. But David remained in Jerusalem. In other words, David stayed at home even though he was supposed to be on the battlefield. One evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. This woman was very beautiful. By the way, David was married, not to this woman. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Let's move on. Then she went back home. And the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Let me ask you, where should kings be when there was times of war? At war. What was David? David was a king. That is not a trick question. It was in the, the scriptures there. David was a king, which means David should have been on the battlefront. And yet David was busy watching Netflix and hanging out with his mates back at home and his eye was caught by a beautiful woman that was not his wife, but he should never have been there. David's mission was to be leading the people of God on the battlefield. And he found himself in a season of rest. And it's in that moment the enemy got him. Why was David not there when he was supposed to be on the battlefront? Possibly it was the good intentions of those around him. He said, hey, you know what, David? You're so important now in the scope of when it comes to battles. The stories of the victories you've had, it would be not a good story if you went out on the battlefield and your life got lost. It, it could wreck the confidence of the people of Israel. You, you've already fought so many battles. Maybe you're better to stay at home. 
Maybe you've earned the, the opportunity to have a rest. You should stay there. And even though the grace of God was around David's life on the battlefield that he had so far managed to avoid any serious injury or death, the people that were most around him said, stay here away from the challenges. Stay here and rest away from the circumstance. And it was those very same people that possibly were the ones that said, that's Bathsheba over there and we probably should be telling you not to go and see her, but they didn't even stop him. The ones that were trying to protect his life from the battlefield were the very ones that allowed for sin to take place while he was resting. You know, it's so easy for us to be around people that have good intentions, but doesn't mean it's God's intentions. Maybe during COVID, you found yourself around a certain group of people or a certain YouTube channel or a certain podcast that has good intentions, but it's not God's intentions for your life. Maybe you're here tonight and you find yourself looking back at the friends that you once had and now you're constantly fighting for the attention of those people, but God's got a brand new set of friends for your life or a small group of people that God wants to speak into your destiny and your future and you're constantly looking backwards and God's saying, look forwards. Because it's in that forwards that God is gonna use those people to bring the best out of you. Listen to me carefully tonight. When your circumstances in life shift, the people that you surround your life really matter. They really matter. They will either move you forward towards the plans that God has and the mission that He has, or they will take you off mission. They will either remove the dreams that are in your heart for all that God has, or they will quench those dreams and they will just become a natural idea that you once had and you forgot. It breaks my heart to think that these men that were around David When David asked that question, who is that woman? Why was no one there saying, David, get your eyes off her. You're married. She's married. And in a short space of time, David not only becomes an adulterer, but he also becomes a murderer because he intentionally sends her husband onto the front line and he's murdered. Like this situation goes from bad to worse. This is the same guy that had the heart after God. A guy that was on mission for all that God has all of a sudden now finds himself as a murderer. He's had an affair and he now finds himself in a situation where when God's prophet Nathan turns up and says, what have you done? He's met with a moment of opportunity and response. When life circumstances come your way, can I encourage you, how do you respond? Do you go with the easy option? Do you go with the easy way out? Because in this story, we could literally write David off. But I'm so thankful that in this moment that we see the heart of David come out. And when he's brought to that point of saying, you need to repent, he rips his clothes off and he pours his heart out to God and says, what have I done? And those people that had surrounded his life that said, get off the battlefield and don't stop going to see her. He finds himself a group of people that are wise. He goes after God's prophetic voice in his life to say, that is not what God has for your life. And if I could be just one voice tonight, tonight, I don't know your story. I don't know where you're from, but if you have got off mission in this last season, the word from God for you tonight is, get back on mission for all that God has. Because on the other side of your faithfulness, there are miracles waiting to happen. There are those that you don't even know right now that God will use for your life to find Jesus. Could be at work this week. It could be, in your friendship groups. It could be on social media, whatever it might be. Stop being comfortable. Stop being convenient. Because they've got a broken world that's looking for answers. And guess what? You carry the answer. His name is Jesus. Someone needs to hear this tonight. The people that God will use in your future aren't resting on the side like currently. I'll say it again. The people that God is gonna use in your future aren't currently sitting on the sideline. They're actively on the battlefront. They're serving God, speaking life into people, bringing hope into people. And how easy it is where maybe a little bit of a fence could kick in, a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of a setback, how easy it is to go and find people that would also have a similar feeling. Poor you, don't take a step of faith again. Why would you keep giving? Why would you keep believing? Why would you keep leading? But I'm telling you, the people that are your friends to your destiny aren't those people. They're the ones that are on the front line that are sweating it out. Whoo, I'm sweating right now myself. They're the ones saying, come on, you can do this. God's got more for you. There's fresh dreams waiting for you. There's fresh faith waiting for you. There's businesses that have not been built yet that are waiting. 
There are entrepreneurs that are yet to actually tap into all that God has. There are people in this room right now that maybe you've had a setback in your marriage, but I tell you what, it could be the very thing that defines your future, the way you respond right now. Teenagers, listen to me carefully. Maybe you've had some setbacks at school. Maybe you've had a challenge go on and you've lived in shame, but you know what? The message of the gospel is not shame on you, it's shame off you. Shame off you, but live in His purposes. Live in His purposes. If you've forgotten tonight what your mission is, can I remind you, the Word of God is clear. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And a lot of times we stop that Scripture right there and go, yes, but it also comes with a caveat, which is you have a responsibility, verse 12. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. I heard that you guys had an amazing season of prayer and fasting at the start of year because He hears our voice. He's not a dormant God. He hears our voice. And you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I'm telling you, if you've found yourself a little bit off mission, a little bit comfortable, it's one decision away to seek Him once again, to put the distractions of the world away, the noise of the world and go, God, I want what you've got for me. I'm telling you 10 years ago, I could have easily, after many years of being a pastor in a church, a disappointing season, that was not my fault. I went back to being a high school teacher. I could have easily stayed comfortable, stayed away from the challenges of what I know ministry could look like. You know, loving people, Often it's really hard. People are very complicated. I know Dr. Yong Yi Cho, an amazing man that died recently, had the largest church in the world with a million people. He was quoted as saying, someone said, why do you pray so much? He said, because there are many people and I hate so many people. So I have to pray for so many people because I hate so many people. <laughs> I guess if you've got a million people in your church, there's a lot of chance to be upset with people, Pastor Mark, Pastor Nina. But people are fickle. There are people that would have been in this church that would have been faithfully serving God pre-COVID. Where are they now? One conspiracy theory away. One shallow belief that didn't go deep enough. But let's believe for those people to find Jesus again. Let's believe for those people to come back into the house of God because it is His answer to the world. Can I encourage you, if someone walks back into your church, don't go, where have you been? Say, it's good to see you. Have that attitude. It's good to see you. I know that right now, statistically speaking in America, after three years, there's been a wave of people returning to the church in the first January and February months, a massive wave of people because most people have been scared. I'm telling you, the response has always got to be so good to see you, not where have you been. There are people here tonight and people wouldn't know it, but you feel so far away from the call of God in your life. You've lost sight of what God has for you. I shared that we had a sabbatical over September to January and it'd be fair for you to say, I'm sure it was amazing and it was, except for the missing out on Mykonos and Santorini. <laughs> you know, for the last 10 years of the church, we've had a relatively challenging free environment if I could explain, in a fast-growing church, you're always having challenges, but really, emotionally, it's not that, not that bad. We've really been very thankful, a lot of growth, a lot of people finding Jesus. And I would have thought going on holidays was gonna be the greatest time of my rest and relaxation that I've ever had, play golf every day, hold my wife's hand and go walking on the beach every day. And the trip started really well. We went to Europe and we came back, and the day we got back on the Gold Coast, Ellen's dad is my wife, my father-in-law, when it had open heart surgery. He was fit, he played golf three times a week, drove his car, 76 years old, had open heart surgery, and he's still in hospital today. Three months later, every, every day we've had to go visit him. We had a challenge with our daughter, she just got her license, she had a really nasty car accident. I ended up having to have surgery four times on my neck and back. I was supposed to have surgery once uh, from a car accident five years, I had a, literally had a headache every day for five years. Talk about trying to grow a church and have a headache every single day. Every day I had, to, I had to rely on the grace of God and I finally had this neck surgery and once I had the surgery, they discovered it's a lot more serious than we thought. 
So over this three-month period, I was going to hospital, two days in hospital, rest and recovery, back in again the next week, have another surgery, have another surgery. I'm talking about like the anesthetic. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know who I was. Another challenge happened. We got to the point where on the 30th of December after our daughter had an accident, I said to Ellen, do we need to like tell our kids all stay home and bubble wrap them and then do a second coat of bubble wrap say no one's leaving the house until the new year begins. Maybe the, this year is cursed. It felt that way. Like just crazy stuff happening. I mean, that was just a little glimpse of what I'm talking about. Like, I mean, stuff that was just out of the ordinary happening. So many, like every single day we wake up, another challenge, another challenge. You know, one night police turn up to our house with, with spotlights at midnight for the wrong house, for the wrong property. Talk about freaking out. At midnight, we live on an acreage property. They're in there with all the lights shining through. And I had to come out and explain, what are you doing on our property with a whole SWAT squad in the wrong place? <laughs> like, it's not very restful when the next few nights you think, are the police going to come tonight? <laughs> and then we took our kids to Bali. School happened, the school holidays, and it was, again, well planned through. We went to Bali, not one problem. But the day before we went to Bali, I went to see my doctor because I was having some, some heart challenges. And I end up in emergency in the Gold Coast Hospital because I think I've got blood clots in my lungs, in my heart, from travel. And so I'm lying there on this bed going, what is going on, God? I come a healthy, fit person. And the doctor comes in and he's like doing all these tests. He's like, sorry, I think you've got a blood clot. They rush me in the ambulance from the GP into the hospital. And I call my wife. I'm like, man, we're supposed to be on a Bali with the kids tomorrow. What is going on here? Turns out I had contracted some kind of a virus when I was in Europe. And they smashed me full of all these drugs through the IVF stuff and just, you know, cleared it up. And I managed to get the plane the next day. And we went to Bali. It was great. We came back to the Gold Coast, more problems. We got sick of it. And then eventually on the New Year's Eve, I was saying, God, what is going on? I don't want to start the start of this year. I'm about to go back into it. What is going on? And here's what God spoke to me. Literally three days out from turning back up to work, I felt God said to me, why are you surprised that you're in your mission field but right now, you're not on mission. And God showed me, he's like, the rest of the time we're away, no problems. But every single day we're in the Gold Coast, which is the mission field God called me to, to start that church. I felt like the enemy was doing everything he could to say, I am not gonna let you go back. I'm gonna try and distract you so much. I'm gonna try and disengage you so much. I'm gonna try and disrupt you so much that you do not wanna go back on mission because he knows what the next 10 year holds. If 10 years ago, we could start a church with 20 people in one city and then all these years later have what God's doing, what could God do with another 10 years from now? And I'm telling you, there was this oppression that I felt because I was in the mission field, but I wasn't on the mission. I was resting in the mission field, but I wasn't on mission. Some of you know what it feels like. Right now, you are in the mission field, but you're not on mission. You are in your workplace though and God called you there, but you're not on mission. And you're wondering why these weird things are happening right now. Some of you need to hear this tonight. Maybe it's in your sports club, your university, your business, and you're wondering why are all these things happening? I'm telling you why. Because God wants us back on mission. God wants us in that place to say, I will not let the distractions get in the way. You know what? I turn up to work that Wednesday morning. We've got this nice big building on the Gold Coast. I walked up and literally... I looked around as I walked to the entryway of these sliding doors, the automatic ones, you wave and it opens up. I just checked, no one was watching. And I turned around and I screamed in the car. I said, enemy, you lose. I'm back reporting for duty. And I walked in. I was like, anyone else see me? This would be really weird right now. They're like, this guy's gone crazy in his sabbatical. And I literally said, enough's enough. And everything's turned around from that moment on. Because I realised, like David he was on the mission field, but he was off mission. Someone here tonight needs to hear me. You are off mission right now. And God's calling you back on mission. He's calling you back. He's calling you back. He's calling you back. Is there a keyboard player here tonight who can join me? I need the Holy Spirit to join me quickly. You wait and see when he puts those fingers on the keyboard, the Holy Spirit, poof, like that. Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, when you can become aware of the enemy's schemes, you can put those thoughts, those ideas, those challenges, you put them on trial and you realise that I can see what exactly the enemy's trying to do. When you can move the power of the Word of God into your circumstances. Someone here needs to, meet, someone here needs to hear me tonight. There is far more ahead of you than there is behind you. 
There are people here, you are off mission and you once were pastors. God's saying, get back on mission. The harvest is waiting for you. There's a reason. The Bible tells us that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's some teenagers in the room here tonight. God's saying to you, would you just dream that God could do big things through my life? Because I don't know who's been telling you you can't dream, but God's saying, dream big. Some of you young adults here. There's a young man in here tonight and you're an entrepreneur. And there's been a setback in this last season. But I wanna tell you this, you're one God dream away from literally seeing an amazing corporation growth built in this world. But at the moment, it's only in your heart, but God's saying, let it out with faith in the natural. There's someone here tonight that you know what it feels like when I said I have a headache every day for five years. The pain was overwhelming. And you're living in pain right now, but I wanna say to you tonight, be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. I believe that the Word of God is active, alive. That we are here tonight to partner by faith to see a miracle take place. Would you stand your feet to this room? I don't know if the rest of the worship team wants to come and join me. And you might be here tonight and you're like, Joel, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my mission is. Well, can I remind you that Jesus was so kind enough to remind us. He could have said anything in His farewell speech. He could have talked about all the great things He had done. He could have talked about all the amazing things that were coming. But instead, Jesus chose to speak to us in a way that said, even we can relate thousands of years later. He said, Matthew 28, verse 18, sometimes known as the Great Commission. And then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of even 2023, to the end of the age. He speaks from thousands of years ago into our moment right now and says, that is my mission for you. And each of us has been designed and made uniquely. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 talks about he, he put a gift on the inside of you. His workmanship in you. It's unique to the person next to you. And it's our job to unlock that gift and say, God, put me on mission. It may be in the ministry, but we are all ministers no matter where we are. It might be on the sporting field this week. It might be at Costco. You live close enough. Aren't you blessed? It may be helping somebody in a nursing home this week. It may be loving kids in the kids' ministry. It may be just helping your neighbour this week with a meal. But I wanna tell you, if you've forgotten your mission, it's right there. Jesus deployed that mission for you and I. And together we have an honour and partner to partner in the kingdom of God with the gifts that God's given us. Take your skills, take your personalities, take whatever God's given you and work them for His glory.